Susanna, I'm one of the conference coordinators this year. I'd like to start off and thank all the attendees here today. I'm glad to see a lot of my fellow Huskies, along with a lot of students who made the trip from schools across the Northeast. We have a great opportunity to bring all you guys together to learn and network with not only the mentors, but the other attendees. It's very important to know that you should, mentor, should network with a lot of these other attendees, since soon a lot of us will be young professionals in the field. A lot of you are here today because you want to succeed in the sport industry, and you have a passion for sports. You are taking a very important step towards this by attending this conference. Make sure you take advantage of this opportunity to gain wisdom from the mentors that have experience in this industry. That being said, I would also like to thank all the mentors here today. Each one of you gave up your Saturday to be here, and we are very grateful for that. Now in our fourth year of the conference, we are excited to see some familiar faces, as well as some new faces that we are excited to welcome and hope to see in years to follow. There are also some people and organizations who are essential for this conference that I would like to thank. First off, I would like to thank Dr. Bird and Daniel DeRosa, along with the rest of the new conference management program. Your advice and support of this conference has been an incredible help. I would also like to thank the NEAC School of Education for helping us secure some of the gifts for our mentors this afternoon. I would also like to thank Professor Norboyan and AJ, who will be helping lead the conversations today with our speakers. And lastly, the Dunkin' Donuts and Red Rock Cafe for providing breakfast and lunch for everyone. We now want to thank the past conference coordinators and the rest of the alumni board that have started this amazing event and laid the groundwork for us. The alumni board have been extremely supportive of us and have given us great advice throughout the whole entire process. From Paul and Christos to Nate Bryant and then Gage and Joe, it is an honor to continue the legacy of being a conference board leader. Finally, I would like to thank all my fellow executive board members. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication to put this conference together, and Mark and I are so thankful for every one of you because without you guys, it would not have been possible. Now, that's enough of me talking, and I'd like to start off our first event of the day. I'd like to introduce UConn Communication Professor Laura McGloin, along with the Chief Commercial Officer of Action Network, Ari Burrell. So we have news, content, paper, 
information, uh, tools and analytics, you can track your bets, and so from that way you can come up with Yahoo Finance or Mint, but everything focused on sports betting. And so traditionally, um, or historically, the Action Network was a subscription box. You had to, the app is free to download, but we have different tiers of content and information to which you have to subscribe. We still offer that, and we, we launched last year what's called our Edge subscription, and that is kind of a $4.99 price, a month price point. Um, this is sort of your, your general, larger audience one. It grew more than double year over year. And then we have a pro system subscription, which is $59 a month. And this is for your more kind of black diamond better who, who wants to know all the player props to bet on. He wants to know what system to follow. By system, I mean, if UConn's playing at home and the team they're playing against is from a different conference, what's their record against the spread? And it could be that they win 62% of the time, they beat the spread. So you, you want to bet that game in that particular instance. And then we also have a, a super high uh, premium service, $250 a month, it's called Unlimited. This is more of your professional gambling company or professional gamblers who just want to see kind of all the lines. Uh, and so when I joined about seven months ago, the goal was really, okay, we have this great audience. Uh, we have, you know, two and a half million monthly active users on our site. We have close to 100,000 subscribers, and sports betting is coming, it's coming fast, it's coming everywhere. And I think everyone remembers the same old DraftKings spending wars with David Fantasy, and there's going to be a lot of money spent on this space. And the Action Network has probably the most qualified audience to convert people to a sports better. So we thought, how do we leverage our partnerships with sports book operators, as well as media companies, as well as leagues and teams, because if the Action Network is kind of holding all these users, how do we get them so that they come to our site and through our site can convert over to Sportbooks? And so we were really building out an affiliate business over the last few months. And we launched it pretty heavily in January, and we've seen amazing success. So the real, my real goal at, at Action Network is to turn us, okay, how do we take a, a larger funnel of growth and monetize our users by giving them best in class content? and also giving them the best information on where they can bet and what the best line they can get on and what the best offer they can get on. And by getting, well, making our users become betters on different platforms, we can essentially market on behalf of the sports books. That's a big part of what I've done here. Uh, and then in connection with leagues and teams and media companies, how do we take Action Network content and distribute that more broadly? Uh, again, we're experts on it. We've had deals with, with Yahoo, we've had deals with Fansided, these are, are big media companies that want to disseminate gambling content. It's easier to come to us as the experts to try to produce themselves. Actually, Chad Nolan, who's our, our chief content officer, is happy to be sitting over in the front row, who's the West Hartford getting, getting a ride at this point, and we switched to the group last night. Um, he, he's, oh, we, we have uh, 30 plus content writers producing gambling focused stories every day. And if you're an ESPN, Google has a Obviously, if we're where Jack came from, if you're NBC, if you're Fox, you want to produce this stuff as well, but again, it's, it's our core expertise. So we hope that more leads, more media companies come to us in order to get our content, get our talent, and then we can collaborate with them on producing it. That's great, all right. That gives us a really kind of good, you know, 10,000 foot perspective on the Action Network. One of the things I think we all want to dive into a little bit more is here we are on college campus this morning, and we're talking about gambling. And obviously, gambling has been a long part of the American social experience. Uh, but however, when we talk about sports gambling, it's often been limited. In fact, we've often thought primarily that you have to go to sports book in Las Vegas, and yet that connotation is now changing. We had a great conversation last week leading up to this, and I want to hear you maybe elaborate a little bit on how do you feel as if the connotation of gambling as a concept, as a social experience, is changing? What are maybe some of the affordances that taking place in society, whether it's rather be technology, or maybe the change in taboo around gambling, that maybe is going to allow Action Network to be a leader in the years to come and to make people feel more comfortable, not only with their content, but with the ability to actually lay that. Yeah, I think, well, I think it's important to, to remember that sports betting, even if it's just become legal online in the last two years, it's not like people weren't betting on sports before that. And I think actually by legalizing it, you know, there, there's some detractors who will say, oh, you're making it available to everyone now, you know, people are going to abuse it. Well, I, I think, it was available to people already, and I think that if anything, bringing it to light brings more oversight and, and makes people more comfortable with it, and actually makes it a safer place to play. Um, I, I was at Daniel for four and a half years, so when I was there, if I say, oh, everyone's better off by being legal, it sounds a little bit you know, like a company line. If you 
think about it, if you're betting with a bookie or betting offshore and you win a huge amount of money, you, you have no recourse to the clock rate. If you can't cash out, there, there's no, you can't tell the police, hey, I gambled illegally if you give me my money. Uh, whereas, you know, FanDuel and DraftKings are regulated entities, they have a regulator you can contact if anything goes wrong. Um, there's also just more, you know, better controls on the industry for the people. I think, you know, there's, when you, when you register for an account, you have to verify your age, your identity, um, your address. It's just an extra step that, that provides an extra layer of protection. Obviously, there are people who, who get around this and gain the system. But again, there were people who were gambling offshore before. So I think, if anything, it becoming legal and more, and more talked about and more comfortable makes it a safer place to play. It also lets people recognize it's very much an entertainment product. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, to have a little bit of skin in the game, and when you're watching, like the you know, there's that, that Eagles Redskins game that had that crazy. The game was over, and there was that kind of backward lateral on the kickoff, and all it led to was, was the Eagles covering the spread, and it didn't matter to the game at all. But for you know, ten to twenty percent of people in the bar, they go crazy. They they hit their bet there. That is purely an entertainment thing. I, I think if you look at it. If, if, well, how I look at it is, if I lose fifty dollars a month, that's fifty dollars at a very good time to watch a sports. And you can say, I mean, I want to see three, four movies in the month. It's, it's, it's a dinner. It's, it's, so it's not, it's not that different than any other entertainment product. I think because it's a vice and there's this potential to, you know, gamble responsibly, that there will always be somewhat of a stigma around it. But I think the more it becomes mainstream, the more people realize it is just. The better controls will be in place to kind of prevent real abuse from happening, and I think eventually it will just become people can't look up with those over time. Yeah, I think that's really interesting in the sense that from a sports business standpoint, although you may not be thinking directly about gambling, I, I think it's important that we acknowledge that there have been so many technological forces that have changed the nature of the industry. And so some of the things I'm thinking about is that when we had the introduction of daily fantasy sports, all of a sudden now, if you were an NFL fantasy player, you weren't necessarily waiting for the entire week, right? You could go ahead and play on Thursday night, or you could play on Monday night, and so I think we've seen an evolution. I would like to, to hear you talk about this. I'm a media effects researcher for a long time and looking at how specific technological affordances of the media change the way that we perceive it, and as a result of that, what it does to our experience. What do you think from a technological standpoint, whether it's the in-stadium experience, uh, whether it's the mobile apps that we have on our phone, whether it is a 24-7 news cycle, what do you think might be uh, the current catalyst or the future catalyst to see uh, something like sports gambling, to see action networks content come right into the direct mainstream? What do you think that uh, technological force might be? Sure, so I think one is data. Um, you know, obviously, the millions of data feeds, and, and the faster they are, the better experience you're going to have as a user. Um, on the action network app, you can track your bets. So if you're tracking a bet, you will be able to see your bet and probability updated in real time. So if, if you bet the Huskies in the favor by six and a half, and they're leading by five at halftime, it may show you that you, know, you have a 60% chance of winning your bet. Every bucket, you know, as the minutes go, that probability will change. Um, the more accurate and real time that is, it's just a better and better experience. It's, first of all, a lot of fun. It's similar to, it's actually funny, so the market in, in the U.S. and Europe is very different. The European betting market, very mature, been around for decades. The U.S. one is, is very based on fantasy sports. I remember we were showing our debt win probabilities to the European tech provider in the gambling space, and he's like, well, can you actually cash out your debt? And we're like, not yet, eventually. You know, we'll do that. He goes, you can't cash out your debt, what's the point of this? And I said, well, it's just content, it's fun. He's like, no one will do this. I was like, that's not up for debate. We had 220,000 people do this last year, so it's not even a question, but it just shows that the American audience for data, for information, for content is just, just is massive because of what fantasy sports did. And so the more that we're able to tap into that and display things that are fun and exciting and competitive for people to watch will be only the added to the experience. The other thing I'd say that I think actually provides we can take the services that we provide in our app, the content we provide on our site, and ingest it and distribute it on much larger platforms. So you can see a world where there's you know, an alternative broadcast that's focused just on gambling, where the, there's a meaningless touchdown in the third quarter that hits the over, and 
EV Ricky on that one day. Let's say they're each 24th and 25th in the tournament. So really irrelevant is the tons of people made that on Ricky was higher. And so you're able to kind of say this was a deep butt in the gambling sphere. And so those alternative alternative <coughs> gambling moments if you bring those into the mainstream, I think is is leveraging our technology will help us make that more popular. So it's really interesting. One of the points I would like to highlight for our students in the room right now is if you heard our answer. His answer was data. And so one of the things that we obviously take great pride in here being a research one institution at the University of Connecticut is that we have a very strong quantitative and qualitative research program across all of our fields and disciplines. So as a byproduct of that, a lot of times when students are going in to their quantitative research methods course, they're saying, I want to do sports because I don't want to do statistics. Ari's telling you differently this morning. I think the way that we separate ourselves, University of Connecticut students and future alumni, is making sure that when we do go into those great team courses that we have, we are trying to excel because we're recognizing the ability to provide high quality data in an efficient picture to be able to go out, to sell it, to say it, to convince people with a high rate of empathy will be the difference in what that content looks like. So I think that that's something that I'm resonating with me right now in terms of it should be open to resonating with our students from the data is maybe one of the most important catalysts going forward. I thought it was quite interesting that you talked about the second catalyst on being this, this idea of entertainment, this concept that uh, in American culture, in particular from sports, we look at it as the way that we do entertainment. Uh, both of my folks are from Ireland. I've spent a tremendous amount of time in my life in Ireland, and so we actually had a chat about um, kind of Patty Powers of the world and the way that sports gambling is looked at in uh, European countries. I mean, it is a fabric, it is a cornerstone of life. You go into the pub, you order your pint, you go across the street, you put a few pounds on the horses, and you go back and you watch the game. And so it's different here. So as we have that evolution, so one of the questions, though, that I'm thinking about here is that we are an entertainment-driven culture, and we're thinking about the data becomes more fun, right? What is it that you kind of anticipate will take place in the future? Like, does data become more live and more real time? I don't, I, I don't know how that's possible. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Or is it something where do you think that the action that's being played becomes more and more kind of in the second, in the moment, and things like? Um, you know, artificial intelligence are going to be able to kind of help provide us more information in the here and now to make it more exciting. Is that the idea is to provide uh, an experience that is higher in terms of entertainment, or is it providing that really kind of more authentic gambling experience that you might see in Europe? Have you thought about how you want to separate or differentiate yourself in those two markets? Well, I think the, as much as we were amazed at how fast they updates when you see, uh, uh, you know, a touchdown. Even like a four to five second delay is massive from a betting standpoint because there are very sharp people who are constantly on top of things and they're at the game, see something. If there's a delay in the gambling staff, they're able to make a bet on what just happened. And that's what, in Europe, uh, live in play betting represents a, a much larger proportion of betting than we're seeing in the US. And you know, Europe, they, they do the effort to still watch. European handball and that on this sort of next point. Um, I think whether it drives an end to the touchdown, whether it's going to miss or make this field goal, these will look kind of like baseball's perfect examples. The next pitch will be a strike, like that will get a hit. These are things that will, will become more and more prevalent here as the market matures, but also the data needs to catch up to the speed of the sport such that any one of us on our phone can make that bet without having four or five seconds of that on top of that, the other element that stands out to me from an entertainment-driven industry, as you kind of um, touched it there, was think a little bit about the future of sports. And so we have seen research on concussions, and obviously now this is becoming a big deal in some of our high-contact sports. And so we've seen a huge evolution in uptick in esports. Uh, have you thought about esports? Where is actually network's position on esports? Will that become a fabric of the gambling universe going forward? And for the young sports business students in the room, how do they think about integrating the potential of esports into the traditional sports realm? How can we ask the question, Chad, about whether we should cover esports? Uh, from our boss, I mean, yeah. Uh, esports is undeniably popular and ever growing. I think, from a betting standpoint, there's a lot to catch up there. I think regulators getting comfortable with sports betting was big, and I think. Having state regulars now be comfortable betting on what to them probably looks like a video game. It did, but it, like the amount of scale involved and the amount of dedication that goes into it, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of catching up, there's a lot of learning uh, to happen. Um, I think if, if there's a market, 
market and there's analysis, and there's interesting angles and information to consume, we, we will cover that. Um, it's, it's, and we have done some coverage of it. I think it's just a matter of what does our audience want? And if, if this happens, we'll do it. If we don't just, if there's interesting, if you could take the kind of approach we make to sports betting and apply it to other betting angles, we'll do that. We have, we have a bunch of stories up right now about the Oscars. Um, and kind of analyzing historical data, there's, there's a great piece about whether you should bet on Ray Belger to win uh, the Oscar. And apparently, no actors between the ages of 15 and 53 have ever won that. Ever won that. And so that was a perfect one of like, if you just use really young or use really old, then we'll just love the trend this year. So if we're able to, to use that historical data, we'll use it for the Oscar for the Oscar. That's really interesting because I also hear anybody who has a particular interest in these sports, maybe one of the developments that you need to try to bring is making it more digestible, maybe making it more consumable for the average user, right? So I think some of us, if you look at it and you don't understand it, it's hard to lay uh, action on something if you really can't process it per se, where some of the other sports were more comfortable with. You mentioned something about state regulators, so let's start to weave this down and, and let's bring this back home a little bit. So on the Action Network's website, you have a great map that's up there, and across that map you have all the different color-coded states. Of course, I was interested in looking to see where Connecticut falls in that. So uh, you might want to share a little bit about where Connecticut is at in that process. So uh, the students in this room who we want to, to graduate and we want to retain your town, we want you to stay, we want you to work in the Harvard, the Waterbury, and Stanford, we want you to keep your town here in Connecticut. So what might that be, uh, what might that look like for our students as they stay in Connecticut? What does that evolution look like as far as handling legislation? Sure. So what's really tricky in the U.S. is that gambling legislation is basically prescriptive in the countries. Um, every state operates its own thing. It's regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. And one of the reasons the Supreme Court case that was overturned a year and a half ago, which uh, opened up sports betting more broadly, was overturned was because it was viewed that it was uh, uh, federal overreach for them to have a law that says the state can't pass state gambling legislation. On the flip side of that, I mean, each state does their own thing and has their, has their, is their own monarchy in a sense. Um, the, or sovereign nation, rather. And so, Connecticut, what would have to happen is first there needs to be a lot of legalized sports betting that has to pass the legislature. It also needs to be a global sports betting law. Right now you have certain states that have, New York, for example, has legalized sports betting that only brick and mortar. So you have to actually go to a casino um, to place the bet. New Jersey, on the other hand, has passed sports betting that you can do it from your phone. So there's legalizing sports betting and then legalizing on a mobile level. And even after it's legalized on a mobile level, it then needs to get regulated. They need to stand up a bunch of rules and, and all the operators need to apply for it, need to submit their their systems to make sure everything's working right, make sure you know, your verification of age is working right. So the steps from going from where you can't bet at all as we are in on sports to now to first being legalized, it needs to have a local game provision. Regulators have to uh, promulgate regulations. The operators need to apply to it. So it's a pretty, it sounds like at some point, yes, it becomes a pretty like, lengthy and administrative process. But um, you can certainly, and there are a lot of grassroots efforts, particularly paying for that, a very large role of lobbying. And there's, you should definitely check out, like, they, they definitely ask people to like, contact your local representative to try to make this happen. It's, it sounds cliche, but that is the way these. And uh, when I was at Facebook for four and a half years, and, and we passed, I think, 21 different daily fantasy laws before um, assholes were revealed, and then kind of focus shifted heavily to sports betting. But it was largely through a lot of grassroots campaigns and through lobbying with regulators and state legislators and just starting to people. And we had tons of users reaching out to their state authorities saying, like, why can my friend in New Jersey play daily fantasy, but I'm in New York? Um, yeah, so you, you can definitely play a role there and check out whatever and we're asking for doing the rest of the level. I think what's fascinating about part of the answer is the fact that there are so many different opportunities for young students to have a say or an influence in the sports business industry. So this gives us an opportunity to transition or segue to your background a little bit. Um, Ari was in law school at Georgetown, and we told a little bit about uh, your story, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I think some of the transitions coming 
back here is that whether it's finance, whether it's marketing, whether it's promotion, whether it's big data, uh, whether it's actually you know, sales, promotion, writing content, uh, being involved in the political side of things. If you love sports, anyone in this room from a variety of range of backgrounds has an opportunity to make their contribution. And I think that that's a little bit a part of your story. So why don't we actually maybe take some time now to dive back into our story because I think that we had a great conversation about how important it is to identify your story and to let your story be the thing that drives your narrative and the decisions you make going forward. So we had talked a little bit about, you know, you were at Georgetown and you had finished up your law degree and, and you went to New York to uh, take a, a large law job. And, you kind of uh, had an opportunity and, and you looked the other way. So maybe you kind of share with the students a little bit about that decision that you made to kind of follow your heart and your intuition uh, and, and a little bit of the advice that maybe you got along the way to resonate with you that might be quite helpful for our students. Sure. Uh, so I went to a big law firm in New York and I did work in practice on international enforcement. So foreign companies were in the U.S. law. So there was a lot of um, Swiss banks, European banks that were in violation. U.S. laws and so sort of these, these cross-border investigations. Um, at, at one point, I got off the job in London, which, if you're doing international work within Europe and the United States, is the most logical place to be. And I remember thinking, if I want to stay in this field, I should take this job. And I was talking to my dad about it, and it was one of the my dad and I. I was like, I'm from Canada, so from Montreal, but really die-hard Montreal Canadian fan. And my dad and I probably talked twice a night at first and second intermission. So any time I wasn't on watching the game, I was tough. And I'm thinking, if my dad goes, you're going to stay up till 1 o'clock in the morning, and then 2 o'clock in the morning to call me in intermission. And so that's obviously not why I didn't take the job, but for a moment I was like, he does keep me very close to my dad. And then same thing with all my friends from college that were in our, it's all of us that are in our fantasy football pool, where we to get together every Sunday, and we're going to snack coffee throughout the Sunday. You kind of lose connection from that in the time zone. And I'm not saying that's why you should or shouldn't take a job, but it did make me realize how, how much sports is a fabric and keep me close with people. And I really had no interest in taking a job in London. I thought if that's the case, I should probably try to figure out a different profession. Um, and, and sort of wanted to realize I really do want to work in media and sports, and that's eventually how I got put in touch with the handle and took the job there. So it wasn't so much that you should should or shouldn't take a job based on how it's going to impact your ability to interact with people. But you should recognize that if that's what you're thinking about, then like that could be a good sign of what your passion is and what you want to do. But that to say, since moving into the sports space, it doesn't really feel, and Chad and I were talking about this the other day, with so the people on Chad's content team, these are people who are obsessed with sports, and they cover it all day long. And when I wake up at 7 a.m., I might have two messages from someone because they were up at 5.30 and they saw something. And I don't want it that I saw it at 7 a.m. So I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, every, there's just this community of passion and care because it doesn't feel like working. If I didn't work in sports, I'd be checking sports news all the time anyway. So it's, it's really fun. Um, but I, I would say, like, it worked out. It, it took a while for me to get there. So it's certainly not something that you should expect to happen right away. And I think I hadn't been to the law firm. I hadn't done another job at a real estate firm before law school. If I hadn't done all these tasks, I mean, there's no way I would have ended up figuring out how much I'd love to work with this industry. So as you transition into the industry, and given that broad background experience, one of the things I thought we could dive into a little bit was talking about what makes the sports business industry unique. And so I'd like to take a moment to try to highlight what do you think uh, not only the best parts of being a sports industry are, but what do you feel stands out as being one of the most important personality characteristics? So you talked about passion and you talked about enthusiasm and love for sport. But then if we go a little bit beyond that, from a skill standpoint, as our students are thinking about developing their resumes, as they're trying to take on different experiences, as they're looking into their curriculum to try to pull out that piece that they think is going to help them stand out, as you transition from other industries into sport, what do you look at and see? There's a common thread that goes beyond just the passion of love for sport, but maybe there's something else that either our, our folks haven't developed yet or they are developing they want to make sure it shines when they get those opportunities. Yeah, I think one of the most, I mean, it's, it's hard to call it so we don't know it, but the ability to execute and, and focus on your output, the ability to actually do something. Meaning, I think a lot of people say, oh, my job is, I, I do X, Y, Z, like I need compliance and put together this, but like, well, well, what do you do? If you're given a goal, hey, we need to, you know, we need to produce 10 widgets, are you, at the end of the day, are you looking and making sure 10 widgets got produced? Like, 
the ability to actually execute hard my friend to like get shit done is such an underrated skill that I think it, it's very fun to, to to be in like front and center stuff and, and go to big meetings and at the end of the day the ability to really be committed to the goals of the company are so valuable. And I think uh, Chad and I talk about this often, there's some people on this content team who are amazing at it, they're really good, but they also wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to see how many people read the stories yesterday, how many people converted to securities, how many people converted to affiliate. Like, they're so, they're taking such ownership of the outcome, and then when they're doing their job, it's constantly in the back of their mind, and it, it just makes them so much more successful to have such a commitment to the goals and help for it. So let's get the time machine. You and I are an RE graduate. We just found out that we were probably on campus one day at Tufts many years ago. And let's let's go back and let's put ourselves in the shoes of our juniors and seniors in the room. And I'd like to kind of have you talk a little bit about something that upon reflection, that your time in college you look back on, and there was a particular course, there was a particular piece of advice, there was a moment or an opportunity to group. Is there something that at the time you thought you were going through and, and you were collecting your credits and you were having experience and it wasn't maybe until 10 or sometimes for me I can sit here and say it was 15 years later that I look back and it's that particular piece of advice, that one moment, uh, a mentor or a guiding hand or whatever it was that had an influence. Is there something that you might look back upon in your career and say, wow, that had a much greater influence on me than I actually thought it did at the time? And we have an opportunity here to share that advice with the students today. So, I took this course that was called Producing Films for Social Change. It was taught by a, a former Dateline producer. You were given a story and you were told, make an eight minute second time. And it was a really fun course because it you know, worked with video equipment and, and write the story script and interview people and put it together. But like the time, I remember the time crunch of it was like impossible. But at one point I said, I don't think we can get this done. Like there was a screening day, and it was, I only get it done time. We have to work all night. And she said, well then, like tomorrow's not going to move. But that's what it's like. There's a group of people expecting to see this tomorrow. So give them a choice. Uh, and I remember thinking like, oh, that, that's true. And it, it's sort of like an entitled way to look at it. Like, yeah, but it's inconvenient for my time. I have to pull it all nighter right now. And they're like, yeah, but you got to kind of think, what is the audience? What is the consumer? And, and that definitely helped us. It was, I remember a group of us who just sat and we spent all night editing it and finishing it. And it was we didn't really get all night at this by 2 a.m. we were done. So there was plenty of time to do it. Um, and kind of realizing that not everything works on your own time. And you got to kind of get stuff done. And um, that, that was a super valuable experience. And I'm happy that it, I was, I was really happy that she didn't give us the not saying don't ask for extensions because you need to get them, but this was one that you could still get. I'm not endorsing that particular piece of things. Uh, no, I think there's a great piece of advice there, right, obviously. And it's understanding why I talk a lot for those of you who've had a chance to work with me, but audience centered communication, knowing what your audience wants, delivering on what it is that you promise and meeting expectations or exceeding expectations when possible. But understanding that you're actually probably a lot more capable than you might think you are. I think from a sports realm, we understand that we know that we have the ability to push ourselves beyond our limits at times. And I think that, that can be true uh, whether you spend time in the gym or whether you spend time in the office, understanding you can go beyond what it is that you think is possible. All right, let's change gears here a little bit and let's have some fun. So I felt like it would be appropriate to get to know Ari a little bit better and hit you with some, some rapid fire questions here to see if we can get to know Ari a little bit better before we turn things over and we get some questions from our students. So, I've got some questions laid out for you here. We're looking for some high quality, fast answers, no repeating answers, all right? So here we go. So the first question, of course, at a sports business conference this morning, what is your favorite sport to watch and why? It would normally be hockey, but the name really bad this year, so I'll go with it all. Okay. My team that could be fair to lose. So I set this up on purpose because I said no repeat of answers. Now you're going to have to ask, answer the question of what is your second favorite sport to play? Because I think we discussed that you love to play golf, is that right? A second favorite sport to play? Uh, that would be hockey. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so we've got hockey and golf covered. Ari and I had a great conversation. We talked about golf. Golf is obviously an emerging area in the sports industry. It's exciting place and hopefully we're going to continue to see uh, a merge between golf and, and action that's out there so that'll be a really uh, interesting and, and kind of exciting opportunity. So because you love to play golf so much, what is your handicap? That's the time of year, so right now it's about six. Wow, okay, all right, so if you're going golf with Ari, you better bring a few bucks. All right, what is your all-time favorite sports movie? Uh, this Happy Game with Golf Us. Absolutely, that is my favorite. What 
It is. So, uh, Chad and I last week we had a little pre interview phone call, and I said, All right, where are you at? They said, I'm down in Miami, and I thought, Of course, you're down in Miami. It's the Super Bowl, so that's, of course, fantastic. So, having had a chance to um, go to the Super Bowl in the past, two part question How many Super Bowls have you been to, and what is your best, favorite, most standout Super Bowl moment? So, I've been to the Super Bowl events three times in two games. But the most standout moment was at the one in Houston, the 28 degree comeback the Patriots against the Falcons, and Paul does the Falcons fan from here. We go with the Patriots fan for a little bit. Had a um, We were sitting behind, like, a lot of people in the stadium are fans of the team. And there's a, it's a somewhat corporate atmosphere in that sense. But there was a fair amount of Patriots fans over there, a fair amount of fans, and they really, really cared. It's kind of funny because you had. People, only people they don't care because they're the fans there, like myself, and then some serious IR fans. And it's not long when you're an IR fan watching the playoff games, this one. And it went until the end. And there was this Patriots fan in front of me who was so distraught and depressed and just straight up miserable. And like, just kind of felt bad for them. They had no interest in having the Patriots win that game. And as they were coming back, seeing like it was like his life, like, his, like the, the blip on the movies when the person's almost flatlining. It was like he was coming back to life with the Patriots and he was just losing it and you could see he kept turning around and looking at other Patriots fans just watching him. Like his, his return to life exactly aligned with the comeback is incredible. I sort of reminded that, you know, there's so many people out there still those diehard fans are there. Most of them are watching at home, but um, that was pretty cool. That's a uh, fantastic story. I think for the Patriots fans who remember watching that game, we all looked a lot like uh, that gentleman where he was in the stadium or elsewhere. So that kind of, do you have any, when you go to, you love to play golf a lot, do you have any particular um, golf traditions that you like to uphold? So what is one of your you know, particular golf traditions or, or even sports tradition at that point? A lot of people um, have different things that they practice. Uh, so what is something that you might practice to try to bring you good luck? So I always play in a father-son tournament with my dad. Uh, growing up in Canada, I fly home and play with it there. And what's funny is my dad, I want to say, four or five years ago, lost get it, that nerd issue, lost to his fingers. So he's perfectly fine. And he's got the fact really that he's gotten really bad at all. Um, and he, uh, his hand, he was about a 13, 14 handicap, and he probably plays a little bit at this point. So 24 handicap. But he like doesn't play four rounds of golf anymore, so his handicap's still reflecting 13, 14. And so for his father's son, now he, he comes to New York because his father's son turned with me, and he won't adjust his handicap. And I try to tell him, like, you got it, I can't get a chance. And he has no interest in winning, he's just like, I'm going to be doing it. And so, like, that annual father son golf tournament has become our, our, our main round of golf here. We stay golf this year, but it's not that much fun golf anymore. So, um, that's probably the, the most traditional sports we have this year. I think it's such a great story. Uh, our father's come up when we talked last week and again today. I think you think back to the people in your life that influenced you to help you fall in love with sports. And, and when you think of those people right now, put in your mind, that person, that coach, uh, that mentor that said, I love sports today. And then the reminder has to be that at some point you have to pass that on. So someone in your life is going to have an opportunity that you're going to get to kind of bring up something you need. So try to pass on that love of sports. Because when you tell these stories later on, you recognize just how influential they are. So you're a competitive uh, hockey player, you're a competitive golf player. Who was your sports idol growing up? Uh, so the obvious one would be Tiger Woods. Um, that was a, I mean, he really rose to the front list I'm not sure how many people are, are big hockey fans here today. Everyone knows Zach Poivre, who played for the Canadians. Uh, so, so Zach Poivre was probably my favorite. I was like always a, a, one of the smaller players on the ice. Poivre was the first round pick that came in 93. And then the finished guy, I think, was the first year of being captain of the game. Really, really fun player to watch. And then in, 19, in 2002, he was like, a week before the season started, had diagnosed with non options abdominal cancer. And not only, I remember thinking as a fan, like, oh, we're going to lose our best player for the season. Like, the guy very easily could have died. And he actually made it back to the playoffs that year. Uh, and only made back to the Olympic score in the first round of playoffs. So that was such a, like, he was always my favorite player. And then that sort of cemented him as a hero in Montreal. So it was such a big, um, does a lot of the community for, for the hospital, obviously. So he was always a, a good player. <coughs> I love when you talk to sports fans because not only do they know, you know who the favorite athlete is, but they can tell you how many goals they scored in the first round of the playoffs from 20-some-odd years ago. It's fantastic.
fantastic. Okay, last question for you. You've been to a lot of great sporting events, but you haven't been to all. So what is the sporting event uh, before you um, pass on? What is the sporting event that you most want to make sure that you try to get to? That would probably be the Masters. Be the Masters on Sunday. Yeah, I think mean, everybody wants to get to Augusta on Sunday for the Masters. So I have a feeling that uh, going forward there may be some that might be possible, right? Maybe we'll see you at the Masters. All right, with, a, with an Action Network t-shirt on hopefully or something, right? Okay, let's transition here um, just for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, and let's just talk a little bit about some kind of parting advice. So we're going to offer an opportunity to get a couple of questions, but I'll, and, and I'll kick things off uh, as we kind of transition to this piece of thinking about not just kind of what we're doing right now, but how do we find inspiration? How do we identify what our story is and what it is that we can do to continue to excel our story? We talked a lot about how the things that came early in our life have had an influence in terms of decisions that we make uh, later on. So for me, it's really uh, thinking about different ways that you know that we identify little tidbits that we've been given. So from a mentoring standpoint, um, I'm interested if you've gotten one particular piece of advice uh, when you were you know 20 years old and you were trying to find your way and you look back on that had a big influence. So we'll start there with a particular piece of advice that you might pass on, and then from there um, we can have a few student questions available and. and there's a lot of, before I ever worked in, in sports, I had a bunch of jobs that I love. And some of them even say that I was fairly unhappy with it. But when I, I remember, so my first job that I called was a real estate firm and ended up not enjoying it a ton. But before I took the job, I was like thinking about it. Look, ask someone who knew the guy who was hiring me. And when I mentioned the guy's name, and he said, say no more, take the job. I think his point was sometimes what you're doing is a lot less important than who you're working for. And I don't mean what they're working for, the people you're working for, because he was just such a good boss. Um, I didn't enjoy the work at all, but he was amazing to work for. I learned a ton. And it also teaches you that every situation you're in, every job you're doing, whether you like it or not, is training you for something else. So, so every negative, every bad job is there's a perfect opportunity to get to like school. You're learning something else, picking up new skills, learning what you don't like, learning how not to behave with your coworkers. That is going to pay a huge dividend down the road. Um, so just remember that there's no job that is not going to you in the sense that you're too good for it, in the sense that there's an easy in terms of your enjoyment factor. You can always find that there's going to be so much you can learn from that experience, even if it's just learning what you need. Um, and that will help you that will help you whittle down what you love. And so just make sure whatever you're doing, you need to accept that what I'm doing right now is is I'm getting something out of it for me. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Saying yes to your opportunities and taking advantage of everything that comes your way. This is always a learning moment, no matter if you enjoy it or not. Fantastic. All right, so do we have a few questions from our student audience? Get some insights from Ari. I have to continue asking questions. Here we go. Fantastic. This gentleman right here. Um, so uh, I studied a lot of last semester at London, and I uh, noticed that as part of the work that I wrote, there was like uh, certain stories, like lab notes and uh, just the places you actually go inside and think that uh, you think that it's a uh, possibility that I could have been So the uh, so it depends on the laws in the states. If they allow mobile gaming, I think you'll see a lot more people betting on their phone. In the states that only allow brick and mortar, uh, that that's what they do happen. The only problem is that they're not kind of a storefronts in the middle of the city. They're at casinos, which tend not to be urban centers. Um, I think in Europe it's a lot more popular because 15, 20 years ago the opportunity to on your phone wasn't really there. I think. My assumption would be in the U.S. it would be harder to happen because one, to get a license to open a store doesn't seem like it's happened yet. So you have to be on a casino premise. And two, it's getting legalized within the hyper technical world now. But if you can bet on your phone, I mean, there are people who would still like going to break more places. But I think, and if they exist, people will go. But I think the fact that convenience factor having in your phone will probably temper the like the, not that it won't happen, just that it won't, I don't know what it's 
Yeah, I find it interesting that this is not part of our culture, that we have that, and I think we almost probably going to skip that phase, and we're not going to have that when we go straight to our phone, we're going to be more comfortable. I also think it's probably rather interesting when we go back to that connotation question, right, where we think about, you know, walking into the casino, walking into uh, the sports book, you know, now you don't have to do that, right? You have to do it from the comfort of your home. It really changes everything, it allows you to take action on anything that you want without having to be anywhere, and I think that, you know, the future of the action network is right, because that reason they're going to provide content internationally around the world to anybody uh, who wants that information and wants to be able to lay at a high level and have as much information as they can. Any other questions from our audience? Yeah, we got one right here. Oh. My name is uh, Sam Bradshaw from the college. My question for you is how important is company culture at Action Network and how important is it to emphasize it? It's a great question. Um, the culture at Action Network is the best culture of any company I've worked at. Uh, and you don't really just need to have a bunch of sports fans that get culture. The law firm that I worked at gives it down actually has an amazing culture too. And it probably would have made a lot of the horror stories for working law firms, but I certainly didn't hate being with the law firm at all and amazing colleagues with people around. So I think when you're around people who are super smart and super high achieving, you learn a ton from them, it also pushes you to work harder if you don't want to kind of pursue not so much competition, but you want to make sure that you're all working the same role and you want to feel that you're contributing to it as much as the next person. And then in action and really that tech companies in general, you look at whereas the law firm was lawyers, so a certain commonality. Whereas if you have a tech company designer, the content writer, the product manager, tech engineer, HR, um, that sort of diversity of thought it is really valuable for you to learn a ton, um, understand how different people view their jobs and different goals for themselves, and so that's helpful. Uh, and, and I think just the, the common fabric of action that we're really well, sports is, is just makes it to a fun the office. And we recently interviewed a candidate who was in a sports event, and this person got the job. And I remember saying, like, it's not a prerequisite at all. I just wonder for you, like, are you going to have as much fun here? They want you to have the best time, and, and, and they can do the great thing. So it's, it's not, I think, because it, they, it's just a very good culture. To do, that's super good. Thank you. Great question. Great answer. Go time for a couple more here in the front. Um, so, as new features by social media companies affect how the action network delivers content, and how can you deliver that feature to fill the business with more opportunities? So, this is where I like to think of myself as scaling, but when it comes to social media, I don't know what you're going to say. So we have a dedicated social team, and they're all over the stuff. And I always find myself, like, whether it's across Instagram, with a few parts of the media, obviously on Twitter, uh, we're always trying to leverage our social media. So whether it's hiring talent that's a huge funnel, like an Aaron Rebell with over 200 followers, to having, you know, super creative ways of delivering social content, like Wolf Wide Wild, with his DS and stuff, and his videos, and his Periscope play night, some Instagram are, are, are swipe ups and, and see more. We we have in Snapchat. So it's, it, it is super important in terms of like how we actually do it. It's one of these things that's set up on the board that makes make sense. But not like social media for myself, but it, it's something we invest a ton in. Um, it's constantly speaking to a really large audience and also an ever very young audience. And the thing with sports betting is as a, as a age gated product, every year there's a million more people. So it's very important that, that we speak to that audience and make people also whatever the newest tools and features are on social media platforms. I believe we have another question right there. Hi, I'm Paris from Phil College. Um, I know like um, Action Network is like relatively new in the space, like legal wise, but where do you see it like being in like the next couple of years? Like I know um, there's a sports betting that um, it's not even about the game sometimes, it's like, um, who's gonna, like, what's the throw in the Super Bowl? Um, how do you see it, like, involving people who are not necessarily, like, by the game? Like, how will it go up and happen? That's a really good question. Something we, we 
grapple with. So as a content provider, we can really cover anything that is being fed up on the internet. So that we, um, I, I think, so how it works right now in the state, so the regulator actually has to approve any vet market that exists. So the regulator has to give drafting approval to offer betting on the hospital. Um, and the Super Bowl gave away for years people talk about oh, what colors are going to be, the, how long is the end going to be. I think there was pressure again to approve these kind of bets. And I think that if you look at here, people can bet on everything. But potential races is all of it. And again, it's just a matter of maturity of making the market here more, more as, as, as sports betting is more comfortable just gambling on these kind of t-shirt events a little more comfortable. <coughs> and as the regulators approve it, and as we talk about it, we will continue to cover it. As long as there's a way to just kind of market news like, hey, so-and-so will be offering Oscar's bets, or do our analysis, we can look at historical analysis and any sort of insight. That's what makes our users really excited. That you know, we can look at, hey, I don't know if the movie was sub, how often the movie was subtitles as one best picture, so it's Parasite really going to win. But you could do the same thing with The Bachelor, you could do the same thing with um, really a variety of things. Like that. So, as the market matures, we expect to make sure we turn along with it before. Okay, and so I'll ask probably the question that we all really wanted to get to, right? So, all right, on behalf of Action Network, what is the lock of the weekend? I think right going into the weekend, a lot of the the golf on Josh Perry is an amazing golf handicapper. So the lot of the week with Jason Day, fell. and I think he's in second. And I think I said Jason Day has been over the years. That was exciting. The bridge was small. I don't know if it was I was thinking he was going to say that. It's been about All right, so there you have it. Right. So we've got our lock of the weekend from our, and if you want more locks of the weekend, you can, of course, follow Ari and everyone at the Action Network. If you haven't done that already, we, of course, invite you to do so. Um, myself and Ari both on LinkedIn, so we'd love to connect with everybody and follow and get involved and keep the conversation going. I think at this point, I would just like to say again, on behalf of the Sport Business Association, on behalf of our current students, on behalf of Husky Nation, on behalf of the alumni, on behalf of the guests who have joined us today, we want to thank you, Ari, we want to thank Action Network for coming down and being a part of this great day. And we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank 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 you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you're on there. So, you know, one thing, you know, this, is, this is a coaching example, coaching administration example, but I think it's important to just be cognizant of the fact that regardless of whether you stay in the sports track or you venture off somewhere else, I mean, this, this example is going to be representative of a situation that you may very well face at some point down the road if you're in a leadership role. And, um, you can see that each individual that was under consideration had you know, different experiences. And again, you're, you're in a running situation hopefully down the road where you can find candidates with different experiences and you need to figure out which one is the best fit for your organization at that time. So, um, while I, I just want to make that point that while this example is kind of specific, it really is general in, in a lot of respects as well. Yeah, I mean in general, and that's with any case study you may do in class. Don't think about the case study, the only facts that you, that you see, right? Think about other stakeholders involved. Think about how uh, the athletic director has to deal with a variety of different people to make this decision. It's not just him. It's him with the PR group. It's him with the media group. It's him with uh, other coaches. Uh, you know, it's super important to analyze these, take what you have, but how can you pull in other reliable information to make the correct decision and ultimately benefit the organization, whether that be a college or a pro sports team or someone out of the industry uh, to, to make sure that you're making the right decision? Um, and that this is not a silo. This is not just the AD, right? There's many, many other avenues and aspects that play an important role in this decision. Um, lastly, since you're going to be presenting them, you each have really about five minutes, okay? It's not a long time. Be right to get right to the points. Uh, be as efficient as you can. State your case and convince all of us that uh, you make the right decision. So keep that in mind. Because five minutes sometimes is 
goes by goes by like that. Okay. Where's the You guys got five minutes. We we'll give you like you know, we'll give you one thumbs up. We got two minutes left. Let you know it's over. Oh, so um, we decided to keep Coach Brown. So um, we said that he's known for being tough. So it's not like really a big surprise that the plan on this, this kind of thing. Like when I was in high school, when I was a freshman, I had this really easy uh, soccer coach. And I took the rest of the year really easy, but then when I moved to Boston, I had a really hard uh, top coach. So it was kind of like the transition that I place had to go through. And the also uh, the officer said that he's never been in a scandal. So he think that he's like not trying to cheat the system, he's just uh, like not overstepping his uh, rules and boundaries. And he also said that there's different types of uh, coaches. So they're going to be tough coaches, they're going to be nice coaches, there's going to be different styles of coaches. So it's just something that players have to get used to. And everyone is different. We can't satisfy the needs of all the players. We just have to make sure that all the players are happy. But we think that a tough coach like Coach Brown shouldn't be a big deciding factor of why we should buy them. Um, so the relationship between Coach and um, Star Player, we said at a higher level sports, it's um, not necessarily, it's not it's going to be harder to please everybody and all the players, so having um, one, like you shouldn't have to alter your relationship for like just one player, you should have um, equal, like your whole relationship throughout the team to be playing for a team and not just one person. And having too much control with that could also be like harmful in the future for the player to the team. Okay, so as far as additional rules go, I think it's difficult to you know, just place rules um, to be too controlling because these are people's jobs and like the coach said, he has his ways of doing his job and he doesn't want to change that. So um, just in the future, um, when you're giving out contracts to coaches, I think it's important to maybe have the sort of way that they opt out because right now it's difficult with them having four years on a contract to just get rid of the middle of the season. And uh, we talked about how Coach Moore had a good relationship with the players, so maybe talk to Coach Moore and have them um, have a little bit more communication with the players to help that relationship improve. Um, so the coach's contract also plays a role. Um, he was on a four-year, $10 million contract, um, and this makes it difficult to opt out, and it would also cause financial implications for the school. Um, so this is the future of him. Um, We'll have other staff look at Coach Brown and uh, assess him. So as the AD, I think it's part of our job as the AD to um, you know, address this, maybe sitting in a practice and talk to the players and just uh, fully assess the situation on everyone's um, viewpoint of it. Yeah, we'd also um, be with the coach and the players to make sure that both of them are happy because we want the relationship to be stable, of course. And we want like kind of agreement so that the coach is still keeping the style of play, most of the players are happy with like the coach and like, what they're doing. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, you guys can stay up front. Uh, Alright, so, so you're keeping the coach proud. So you're keeping the coach proud. So you're keeping the coach proud. He's tough. So you can tell me you don't care about student athlete welfare? So part of what we talked about here is um, you're not going to please everybody. So people are always, like, especially in like a coaching position, you're never going to have a whole team of players be happy with the situation. So like in this type of situation, it doesn't seem like he's being like, overly like, abusive or anything to players. Maybe it's um, just a tough relationship where he's being tough on players, but um, he didn't think that was necessarily something that he didn't want to do. Like, like, Say if this um like just theoretically continues and we have a situation like we have here and then you see multiple, you know, your star player or your point guard enter the transfer portal, do you go back to look at the situation or what would you guys do with that? Um, I think we should just 
I guess we take it like step by step with like slowly just see what would be a big issue is that I think would take action. And like we know that if we stay out and I think we do something, it's probably change the coach. But the way that it seems right now, it seems like there isn't a big issue. It's just more the players getting used to the coach. Like this happening. Anybody else? Questions? I, there's a couple other things that aren't on here that you need to consider. Um, you know, first off, you know, are there any clauses in this contract? I mean, some of this stuff may sound familiar to us here. Are there any clauses in this contract uh, for any sort of disciplinary issues, NCAA violation, um, conduct issues, you know, things of that nature? Um, because, you know, let's, let's put it quick. If there is, then, and you can be fired with cause, then the money's irrelevant. You can get rid of you want. Um, the other thing, again, some of you may be familiar with the situation, um, what's, are you public or private? I mean, that's not familiar here. And if you're public and your coach is in the union, okay, <laughs> how, what does that process look like? And, um, you know, you need to file a grievance, uh, you know, how does everything work? Because, and it's been very public here, you know, if you have a situation where you want to fire a coach for what you feel is with cause, you may still get resistance on the other end. So, um, again, those are some factors that aren't in here, but could be tangible and relevant to your decision making process. Next 
question. So you graduated. Yes, yes, you did. What was that first year transition like for you and um, any obstacles and also the wins you experienced as you were learning? Yep. Um, so the first year, I'm not going to say I was lost, but I did not know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I did know I wanted to work in sports and I did know I wanted to start in communication. Um, I love interacting with people and speaking with people. Um, so that was one reason I wanted to get into communication, but I also know that Working in communication, you get to touch so many different areas um, and different departments. So that was a way for me to get relevant working experience and also learn about a lot of what I have here. Uh, learn about back operations, learn about community relations, learn about marketing. Um, all, all along kind of developing what my interests were, figuring out, oh, this is something that does interest me or mm, this might not be for me. And so I was getting that experience through communications while also learning about what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, transitioning from college to the first year uh, working, it is perfectly reasonable to not know what you want to do, but you should put yourself in a position to learn from other people in the industry. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, I found that more often than not, everyone is willing to take a phone call, answer an email, um, but at the same time, we need to reach out to people, bring something to the table, don't just come up to them and say, I'm looking for a job, I'm looking for an internship, do you have anything available? Take the time to learn about that person that you're reaching out to, uh, learn about their path, ask them, what is something that was valuable to you, or what's something that, if you could go back and tell yourself, a tip, a piece of advice five years ago, um, what would you, what would that knowledge be? Bring something to the table when you to reach out to these people because everybody, um, their time is so valuable and you might only have one shot to network and make that initial connection, um, so you don't want to waste it. Thank you. And then getting into your career now, if you can provide context into those initial jobs that you took and then your current position and the details that are in the last year. Um, so after college, I interned with Boston Celtics in communication, both on the basketball communication side, which meant I was dealing with any trades, um, our media day, press conferences, anything that directly related to the on-field product, on court product of the team, um, but also in corporate communication. So when we would get a new partner, um, when we had a community event, Anything that related to the business side, I was also involved in, which again provided a great learning experience to the organization as a whole. Once that internship ended, I went to do a seasonal position with the Cleveland Cavaliers and from Ohio. So I was back at home for a year, which was interesting. Um, also focused mostly on the basketball communication side. Um, after my position with the Cavaliers was over, I took a seasonal role at the NFL's office. Um, focusing on media services, so any events that we put on, whether it was Super Bowl, the scouting combine, um, the draft, owners meeting, international games, um, I would work on the media logistics for that. So for example, the Super Bowl this year, we had about 6,000 media that were credentialed. Um, so anything from making sure they were credentialed properly, uh, arranging press conferences, interviews, making sure that they had a smooth experience and hopefully covering us favorably, but making sure that what we controlled which was providing them with a professional world-class environment is the team that I was on um, during the internship. After my internship with the NFL, I accepted a full-time role with Boston Celtics. That was the team that I initially interned with. I spent three seasons there and then accepted a full-time role back at the NFL office um, for the same team that I'm in right now. You. And can you just talk a little bit about the skill sets that go into your current position and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yep, so for skill sets, um, attention to detail and working in a high-paced, high, fast-paced high, fast environment, um, I think are the biggest skills to have, especially in the sport business industry at the NFL office, something is always going on 24-7. And so being accessible, um, again, attention to detail, and making multiple stakeholders happy at the same time. Those are all very challenging things to do, um, but something that is very valuable for me and also the people on our team. Yeah, that's 
more what I do right now. Uh, so in addition to being on the media service side, I work on our publicity efforts for all of our player programs, and that includes at the youth football level, high school level, collegiate level, current player programs, and our former player programs. Um, I'll key in on our current player programs and former player programs, because a lot of people, including players, don't know that these exist. Um, I would say the perception of the NFL is that we do not care about our players. The players, once they get off the field and they're done, they're playing to get over. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, there are so many programs in place for players to succeed after the playing stage are done. Um, if you're interested in broadcasting, we have a program for that that connects players, current and former, with some of the top industry experts where they will go and with them, see what goes into producing a show, how uh, like reading a teleprompter, um, networking with individuals. That is just one of the 10 programs that we offer um, for players, both current and former, to kind of put them in a position to succeed in life once they're playing with their over programs. For if players are interested in developing a business, um, going back to school, we have a social assistance benefit. If they're interested in coaching, we connect them with scouts at the team level. Um, people in football operations, officiating, anything that a player is interested in. There are so many people at the league and each team that are solely dedicated on making sure we are putting them in that position to have a successful life once their once their playing games are done. Um, and so I get to work on the efforts for this program. Thank you. And switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about the intersection of sport and social media. And so the first question is, how have you utilized social media to enhance your own personal brand, and how do you believe that it's helped you get to where you are today? For my own personal brand, um, luckily, I guess, my parents were always on social media before I was, so that I knew that once when I was on social media, anything that I was posting, um, I knew my parents were looking at it. So that definitely played a role in anything I was posting, because that was a reflection of me and also a reflection of my parents. Um, I would say, also a cheerleading, our coach, um, who's no longer the coach here, uh, she has suspended girls for games for things that they posted on social media. So I was always very mindful of what I was posted and how I represented myself because I knew that it represented more than myself. Um, I think if anything, if you are posting anything and you have the question, is this something I should be posting, it is probably best not to post. Um, I know that when we're looking at new hires, we absolutely look at social media. Um, my my direct supervisor, we were looking at possibly hiring somebody, and he looked at her Instagram and immediately did that. So I, I do think employers take into account what you're posting on social media, how you're representing yourself, so definitely be mindful of that. And going along with how has the multiple platforms for social media impacted your field and just sport communication broadly? Um, I think social media is both a great thing and could be a negative thing. I think it takes a very long time to build your brand, your credibility, um, and your fan base, and it could take seconds to lose it, um, depending on what you're posting on social media. So I think it's great that you're getting that instant um, engagement and connection with fans, players, media, sponsors. Um, it can also be taken away very quickly. And as we continue to see more content like on Twitter, you can watch like games on Twitter, how, um, I guess from your standpoint, is the NFL moving in that direction of not just focus so much on cable TV, but understanding you can watch live TV on Snapchat and live feeds? Um, so we, for Super Bowl, I believe we had about 102 million viewers across TV and digital platforms last week, and that's just crazy to think that you can watch on your phone, on Twitter, like I said. Um, we have experimented with streaming more games on Twitter, and it is very popular, so I only see that growing as we can progress. And what's the business behind that? Like, is it um, is your ROI the same when we're thinking about cable TV versus live streaming and a lot of social media platforms? Well, I think <coughs> different audiences are all obviously consuming content um, in different ways, so we are trying to cater to those different audiences. Um, obviously, younger people are watching more on their phones or on Twitter, and so 
So providing that content, that content and meeting that audience where they are um, is a big focus of ours. So how many of y'all watched the Super Bowl last weekend? Great. How many of y'all remember the clip of the young child that looked like Louie J? Okay. She was a part of the team that put together that clip. So we are going to play it and then we'll go to the next set of questions. So, over 
submitted to us over a two-week span, and we ended up selecting 32 kids and surprising them, um, revealing that they were going to be in the commercial and that they were going to be coming to Super Bowl. What they did not know is that they were going to run onto the field, and literally that was right leading up to kick off to deliver the game ball and kind of stand with the crowd. That was a surprise they did not learn about until the day before um, Super Bowl. And so, like you said, we're looking forward to the next 100 years and trying to focus on youth. As we saw in that commercial, there were so many football grades, whether they were current players, former players, ownership, um, just trying to connect everything and showcase that I felt stronger than ever. Um, we're very excited about the next 100 years. We're excited that we had a very successful first 100 years and we're going to top it. Um, so that is how that commercial came to light. And Again, I'm glad that you said the live transition. We were very worried about how that would come to play, um, but the kids were so surprised and so excited, and it was very rewarding to see that come to fruition. Yeah, and what was it like putting the story together? We talked about that in sports marketing, that you can have many ideas, and you know you want your audience to be receptive to what you think they're going to like, but this ad was received extremely well, and so how did y'all get to that point? It was. Um, a large effort across multiple stakeholders, I would say. Like, there was a, a, an end goal for marketing, there was an end goal for new football, there was an end goal for PR, and some of that aligned together. Initially, some of it didn't. So it was a massive undertaking by our entire, not only organization, but the team had to buy into it, the players had to buy into it, and it took a lot of um, months of meetings and discussion and Every day it seems like a new challenge came up, but at the end of the day, we all came focused on what our end goal truly was um, and came together and pulled it off. Yeah, so for those that follow football, they're able to see some legendary greats in there, some more recent players. Why is that important for the NFL to show the um, athletic life cycle of their athletes? Sure. So we, again, let me go back to the brand and the perception that we have of not caring about players off the field. Um, we are actually trying to not fix it, but showcase that we do, and we found that engaging players from starting at the youth level, it doesn't hurt to start getting them accustomed to what the NFL um, does offer for youth and high school players, for collegiate, for current players. Um, if we're just starting to reach players at the current NFL playing days or former, it's honestly too late. And so showing that we have authentic engagement year round at the youth level, not just through commercial, um, but through player camp and through all the legends that we are teaching, or the former players that we are teaching to become youth and high school football coaches, um, is very important to us. Again, if we're trying to showcase that we're very excited about the future of our sport and that we're invested in it. And so we're not only caring about current players, it is all players across all different levels, girls, boys, all ages, um, that's something that's very important to us. Yeah, and so this uh, commercial was produced through the league office, correct? Yes, we have a um, marketing agency that we employ for this, but yes, it was the league office driven. So given this was through the league office and you once worked with um, individual teams, can you first just speak to, just a question one, yep. the differences with what the um, working in communications, communications NFL versus NBA, and then the second part is working for a national league office versus an individual team. Sure. So I think I might have to combine those two. Um, at the team level, you have one true common goal, and that's to win a championship. Um, at the league level, we are being of service to our 32 clubs, and that means taking a broad lens of these are the initiatives that we have in place. How can we best support the teams and their efforts in their local markets? They know better what works in their market than we do in New York. Um, so it's making sure we are in service to the club and providing them with resources, support, social, in person, um, assets, anything that they need from us in order to make our initiatives work in their markets. Um, that's a large portion of what we do at the league level in communication. From the team side, we're more implementing those and executing those programs and initiatives. Um, 
So I would say I'm very happy that I've worked at both the team side and the lead side because I think in my decision making at the lead side, I always try to place myself back at that team level. As if someone was calling me from the MBA lead office while I was at the to do something, I'm the person that has to go deliver this news to the players or the media or something, even though it's a policy that the league is putting in place. And so when I'm speaking with our teams and our clubs um, or players with my lead hat, I always try to think about it as a team level, how would I actually have to go execute this and does it make sense from a lead standpoint, what I'm saying. I know we want to leave time for questions and answers so we get that engagement, but the last question I have here is, as we have individuals about to transition into their professional careers, what are some competencies that you're noticing um, individuals are graduating with, and how can we share the knowledge with those of them? Um, a big one, I would actually say, and this is something that I did at times until a few years ago, but trust yourself and trust your voice and what you bring to the table. Um, again, strengths that other people in my group have are not my strengths, and that's okay, but what I bring to the table is not the same as what they bring, and that's what makes us a well-rounded group. So trust in your voice and that you do add value. Um, don't be afraid to propose new ideas. I would say, an example, up until two years ago, uh, our press releases were straight up text, just <coughs> very text heavy. And one of our seasonal employees brought the idea of turning that into a, a, an infographic and delivering the same information just in a way that was more visually appealing. And from there on out, since the team's not afraid to propose that idea, that is how we deliver. We still do press releases. Um, but most of our information is accompanied with a social media graphic, and it's easier for people to consume that information. It's more visual appealing. And he was not afraid to propose that idea in a room where people were doing standard press releases for 25 years. Um, and so having the confidence in your ideas is something that is important and welcome. Um, people always, you know, we should be aiming to do things better and not the same. So please feel free to contribute your ideas. Um, they are welcome. But also say attention to detail, being able to multitask, to meet deadlines, we're going to have that safe environment. Obviously, those are all qualities that um, can be very beneficial in your in life, but especially in the career and sport industry. Thank you, Taylor. Round of applause. Um, as a woman in the sports industry, I feel like it's easy to get 
PR director a note just saying, best of luck this season, hope all is well. Take care. Something quick, it doesn't have to be, here's an article that made me think of you, or can you give me, can, do you have time for a phone call? It really could just be, good luck with this event, um, or, you know, NBA All-Star coming up. That name you text saying, like, best of luck in Chicago next weekend. They're just finding, op creating opportunities to get yourself in their inbox without maybe asking for too much effort. Like, I'm not asking for a response with that. I'm just saying, thinking of you, best of luck, hope this goes well. Um, finding those key moments to keep in touch without maybe keeping in touch too much um, is a good way. I know that one of the women I, I take flying traffic lessons, and one of the women I met at an NFL MLB networking session um, actually was interested in flying traffic lessons, so now we go together. And so it's being intentional about networking um, and also just trying to find those key moments where you can get in front of someone, whether that's an inbox, quick call, something, um, just maintaining that relationship so that down the road, if something does open up, you're top of mind.
in a two-week span. One um, actually went on maternity leave a month early and then two took new positions. So in January, which is a very busy time for our group, um, I normally just do Super Bowl and last year I ended up doing our championship, our conference championship game, Pro Bowl and Super Bowl. And to be honest, that was not a healthy situation um, from a workload perspective, from like my actual health, it just was not a great position to be in. And so honestly, after that, I was kind of like just done. not in a good place mentally, um, an angry person, and I'm not an angry person, but I was coming into work angry and miserable, and I could see that that was affecting my friends that I made in the office and the work that I was doing. Um, and so I think, you know, reflecting on that and kind of removing myself from that situation for a little bit, where I realized that this is not the image that I want to be projecting, this is not the person that I am, um, what needs to change in order for this to change, and that required having an honest and candid conversation with my boss, um, which was very difficult, and I don't know if there's ever a right, you know, a right way to handle those difficult conversations, um, but it did get to a point where it just wasn't fun for me, and again, the, I mean, the minute I was coming into work angry for like a three week span, I knew something needed to change. So I think last year was very difficult and kind of really made me question why do I want to do this? Is this something that's for me going forward? And to be honest, like, I didn't know it was a bad answer anymore. Um, I will say a lot of work I get to do is very impactful. And so working on our player programs and seeing that. They don't have that lost identity after you know, their planning days are done and that we're helping them survive that transition into the next step of their life. Um, and seeing someone get dropped on air, seeing someone open successful businesses is very rewarding to even play a very small role in that. I think the impactful and rewarding experiences are what made me realize that like, this is still something that I really enjoy being a part of. Okay, and I think we'll take one more question. Uh, circling back to the challenges that I was facing, uh, mm -hmm. just right after the floor and came up, and deeply, that is that something that we want to help and really work on? Try to get better, retire early, and really get better control of the technology. So I don't think it's something we're worried about retiring early. Um, but again, we want to make sure that we're providing the best resources and training and initiatives for players, regardless of if they are playing on the field or if they are transitioning and after retiring. So I think that's something that's still to come because I mean, as the years progress, we'll continue to see if like, the playing span um, for players is shortening and if there's something more that we need to do about that. But right now, I don't think that's a major concern for us, but that's 